When we're in that cliché discussion of best feature debut films of all time, it's not often, I think, that we're considering plausibly the best of them. Well, it might not be Citizen Kane, but it's vaguely comparable, and vaguely superior. It may or may not be. I'm just trying to provoke the orthodox. Huang Jianzin's 1985 feature, The Black Cannon Incident, is one of the most remarkable turns from a debut feature director. Now, whilst Jianzin had a careful screenplay, adapted from novelist Shang Xianliang by Li Wei, already in polished for him to execute, he still apparently insisted on this film being his as much as anyone else's. As a result, every frame in the Black Cannon incident is adjacent to a cinematographic masterpiece. Obviously, coordinating and observing the cast's performances required an able director, and Jan Zin had graduated from the Beijing Film School in 1983, presumably with some honours, as they granted him the responsibility of helming such an elaborate, potentially precarious production. Actually, the production was likely a lot more modest before Jan Zin insisted on his artful angles, his peculiar framing, and evocative interior lighting schemas. The Black Cannon Incident is a masterpiece of screenplay execution. Imagine you were given this screenplay, a glorious, absurdly frustrating series of inconveniences and miscommunications set amongst a Chinese mining company. Could you have chosen, and staged, a finer series of frames to act as your screenplay's realisation? I like to think that merely by showing off screen caps I could demonstrate the power of Jan Zin's film direction. Released the same year as Terry Gilliam's classic feature Brazil, The Black Cannon Incident is a comparable odyssey of bureaucratic misunderstanding and big state fallibility, situated in a foreign communist experiment, China's modernising industries in the 1980s, rather than in a satire of the UK's post-war consensus socialised state merging into newer Thatcher era moral coldness and cynical selfishness. The thing which most makes me love this film is its lively framing. This film is not one which would have inherently seemed to suggest the imagery which it contains, although each frame offered throughout the runtime is communicating as beautifully as possible the vector of the narrative currently. To explain further what this film is actually about, it is about the difficulties of translating foreign languages efficiently, the inanity of certain management formalities, the relevance of the human factor within a bureaucratic node, the complexity of a contemporary corporation, the impossibility of clean effectiveness of any human company. Yes, the inevitable lack of logic to internally govern some of the most practical functions in a society, when certain management protocols appear to exist so they might preserve an emotional human delusion, rather than rework a human into an operable tool. Company protocol and vaguely impractical logic ensures that an employee's letter to a hotel re regarding a missing Chinese chess piece, the titular Black Cannon, becomes something of a minor scandal amongst the mining corps, as well, as well as frivolous panic and silly frustration amongst the police. The woe, the comic absurdity of this film is the sheer controversy, utterly unintended, of the protagonist, that employee, Zhao's letter. And poor Zhao will spend much of this film blithely unaware of the consequences his telegram has caused, until its conclusion, wherein another character expresses that he ought not have ever sent such a message. Perhaps the major observation of this film is Zhao's question in response. Why can't I sell the telegram of my own? Yes, why not? Why are personal inquiries, informal communication, and non-protocol humanity so seemingly destructive or at odds of corporate and or bureaucratic hierarchies? Between the hiring of inexperienced translators, the apparently innate anxiety of authority figures, and every human scared of protocols and procedures which they themselves set for their own presumed safety and convenience, one begins to assume that the culmination of anthropogenic structures are not manifestations of logical, ordered thinking, but rather a possibly pathological absurdism. It's what Kierkegaard may have contemplated about Kant's insistence in the categorical abstract, which could be seen as Kant's, or certainly Mr. Hegel's, apparent faith for interactive structures, or at least the 19th century Prussian state. Daryl Wenneman writes, Kierkegaard's insight was that Kant's philosophy did not have the resources to overcome the redoubled anxiety he called despair, because moral law was for Kant the highest norm to which he could appeal, but the moral law is an impersonal norm that binds imperfect human beings to the unbending structures of, strictures of pure reason. But why need reason apply to the man who plays Chinese chess by himself and sends a letter seeking out one of his missing pieces? It doesn't. Perhaps this is what set everyone else off, that they couldn't deduct the reasoning behind Zhao's motivation. 
Every corporate decision made is justified by reason, and human triviality is dismissed as emotional distractions, although sometimes the human component is more vitally logical and hugely important to the grander reasoning typically espoused. To those of who whom have not seen this film, do view this film and inform me if I am at all mistaken about this mighty masterpiece, and to those who have, consider how the German character Hans wasn't merely being sentimental when he insisted that Zhao was the appropriate translator for the job. When humans form together to build a structure, they cannot be expected to be reduced to replaceable tools. Every tool has a different function and none are the same. Human beings, unlike physical tools, cannot be mass-produced on an assembly line, yet, and so until then, maybe, even just for the company's sake, treating your tools like they are still human beings will see you get the most efficient use out of them. The Black Cannon Incident ought to be made mandatory viewing for anyone who thinks a human society is functionally infallible, irrefutably logical, or even just worth admiring. Actually, no one seriously thinks that. The Black Cannon Incident is a must-see classic. It will be an important piece of your film journey, determining your continual search into the annals of world cinema masterpieces, or confusing you as to why you'd been neglecting that world for so, so long. Why didn't anyone tell me about this film? Why, indeed. Let's change that. Everyone view The Black Cannon Incident, and then go forth. Do as you will. Don't give in to the cowardice or shoulds. Huang Jianzin at one time was a superlative cinema genius, and his subsequent classics would share similar themes, establishing Jianzin as perhaps the most impressive figure of that fifth generation epoch, or at least someone who Noel Oakeshott occasionally seems to consider their finest or close enough to being their finest sino. Jianzin's more recent films have been dismal by comparison. He helps helm these lousy blockbuster things in China. No, they are much better than what you see from the States, even if they are occasionally mildly better. Being better than Bay and Emmerich isn't being better than very much, frankly. But at one time, he was one of the most visionary film directors in the world. Huang Jianzin, if you can hear me now, utilize all of your recent profits in order to fund a good film again. Do it, please. The world needs you. You can save the world forever, Jianzin. Do the right thing. Direct real films again. We need them more than ever before. Anyway, thank you all. Have a good day. Especially you, Huang Jianzin. Make real films again, buddy. You can. The world's waiting for it. We need you, man. <laughs>